Hello, Irie, everybody. We have the legend Bob Marley in the background singing along with the Whalers. Stand up for your rights. I'm here, Michael Michon, president of the SCA. We're going to be speaking with Brooke Goldstein shortly. Brooke, among other things, is the executive director of the Lawfare Project. She is the co-founder of End Jew Hatred and the author of a book soon to be released, End Jew Hatred, A Manual for Mobilization. I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Sephardic Community Alliance, uh, we were uh, established about 15 years ago as an organization with a mission to reinforce and preserve the traditional Sephardic values uh, based on uh, certain principles, including several that, if, that um, have to do with education, growth through education, Torah and higher education, interaction with society. And uh, we very much uh, stand with the state, not just the land of Israel, but the modern state of Israel. So these are things um, that intersect with Brooke's work, and uh, we're uh, excited to hear from her on, the, on um, some of her new projects. Uh, throughout the years, we have at the SCA uh, done a lot of programming with respect to education, uh, education regarding the Israel um, uh, conflict in the Middle East, uh, and we have partnered with organizations to provide content to our community and to help educate our community members, especially young adults, on what they might uh, be uh, met with uh, upon attending school on the college campus. Um, so without further ado, we're going to uh, loop Brooke, Brooke in. Great to have you, Brooke. Thank you for having me. We know that you're very busy, so we appreciate the time that you've taken. Um, you know, I, uh, by way of introduction, mentioned uh, to everybody about the Warfare Project and what, you, uh, what you've been doing with that uh, team, your team of lawyers. We hope to hear more about that and about End Jew Hatred and about your new book, End Jew Hatred, a Manual for Mobilization. So uh, one of the things, Brooke, that I uh, started with is the SCA, the Sephardic Community, Community Alliance, uh, is very involved with education. And we've been trying to educate uh, our community members who are going to be going to college, who are on college, on the college campus, uh, about some of the conflict, uh, the, the uh, Middle East conflict, but the Lawfare Project is about something else altogether, isn't it? It is. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for having me today. It's really an honor to speak to this community. I have an incredible amount of respect. Um, the Sephardic community is known not just for being pro-Israel and Zionist, but for actually getting things done. Um, so I'm so happy that we're speaking today because we all agree that we have a problem. And the problem is rising anti-Semitism. And sometimes it seems like we're, you know, reaching for the lowest branch and trying to figure out how to deal with this. Um, none of us want to see uh, anti-Semitism rise. There are so many organizations out there fighting anti-Semitism, and yet we're wondering why isn't anything working? You know, why are we seeing this rise of Jew hatred when we are in the age of minority rights movements? Right. And, and the Jewish people are the oldest, most persecuted minority community in human history. And why is it still socially acceptable to engage in Jew hatred on campus, in the workforce or otherwise? Um, so you were kind to mention I run an organization called the Lawfare Project. We have a network of over 600 attorneys and 42 major law firms, and we bring civil rights cases on behalf of Jewish communities around the world. Uh, if you think about it, all of the rights, the civil rights, the human rights that we enjoy in this great country, the United States of America, is because of civil rights litigation or impact litigation. We just saw, for example, affirmative action uh, being struck down by the Supreme Court. Desegregation in this country came through a seminal civil rights case, Brown v. Board of Education, Roe v. Wade, again, the women's right to choose, recently also struck down by the Supreme Court. But what we do is we file seminal civil rights cases on behalf of Jewish communities to ensure that we also have equal protection under the law. So that's what we do at the Lawfare Project. And also, I think we should talk a little bit about the Andrew Hatred movement as well. 
Oh, it's remarkable. It's a, it's a large, pretty large team of lawyers. Uh, I know we recently just celebrated the 59th anniversary of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, making it illegal to discriminate on the basis of religion, of, excuse me, of race, color, or national origin. And by executive order, that was specifically um, uh, in extended to those who, have this, who, who face discrimination based on shared ancestry or ethnic characteristics and specifically to anti-Semitism. So um, it, it, it is sort of ironic that uh, anti-Semitism should, should be growing um, at a time when uh, awareness uh, uh, about the other uh, is, you know, uh, in front of us. Um, I think you in your bio were uh, mentioned to have coined the phrase Zionism as a progressive value. And, um, you know, I think that's part of, we, we, we played um, Bob Marley on the introduction. I had mentioned that my first employment discrimination case before I was even a lawyer practicing in a legal aid clinic was on behalf uh, of a Rastafarian actually, mm -hmm. who uh, was um, uh, actually uh, unable to get permanent employment for the sole reason that he wouldn't cut his hair. He took out the book of Leviticus and uh, showed me the passages uh, about uh, w which he believed um, applied to him as a black Hebrew. But um, let me ask you, how is that argument? Is, is, is litigation, do you think, the best way to make the case? Are there other efforts that are being uh, made in terms of outreach um, on campus or otherwise? Or do you see that um, those really are uh, a, pale, a pale alternative to, to actually um, educating and um, litigating? So. It's interesting that you mentioned, um, we spoke a little bit before about that case that you were involved in. And just this morning, I had the privilege of interviewing Joanne Bland, who is a black, uh, very famous civil rights uh, advocate. Um, she was the youngest person ever arrested uh, at a protest, at a civil rights protest in the 50s and the 60s. And she was right up there uh, with Martin Luther King. And, you know, we have so much to learn from the black civil rights movement. And the one thing that she told me that really stuck out from this morning is you have to be unified. You're not going to get anything done if you're not unified around a very specific issue and a target. And you mentioned earlier Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Now, the unfortunate truth is that the Jewish community is so divided on political partisan lines that when the executive order came out to include Jewish students, Jewish people to be protected under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, it was the Jewish community that came out against that, some members of the Jewish community, because they didn't like the fact that Trump had issued the executive order, because their hatred and their distaste of the Trump administration clouded their judgment, and they ended up arguing against the application of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act to protect Jewish students on campus. Now, I can never imagine, okay, the NAACP or the Center for Constitutional Rights or the ACLU coming out with a position like that motivated by partisan politics against the interests of their own community. And so unless we are united around a very simple, what I call base consensus, which is that we must end Jew hatred in our lifetime. We must do what's necessary, overcome our partisan divides, overcome the divides between secular, religious, you know, orthodox reform and unite then we will not be able to get anything done. And, and case in point is CUNY. And I'm hoping we can discuss a little bit what your uh, insights are there. You know, we had discussed prior to this live. Um, my, you know, macro view of the situation is that the Jewish community looks like a paper tiger. With all of our influence, with all of our organizations, with all of our big budgets and CEOs and donors, right in our backyard at the City University of New York on multiple campuses is the most vile of all systemic bigotry targeting the Jewish population from the professors, from the administration, coming from the student body. And I urge, I urge the Jewish leaders, not just in this community, but all communities to unite on this one issue. Because the key to any successful civil rights movement is ensuring consequences for bad behavior.
And unfortunately, as a Jewish community, we live in a very target-rich environment. You know, last week it was Roger Waters. This week it's the BBC's awful, you know, interview with Naftali Bennett. Next week it's going to be, you know, some BDS vote on so-and-so campus or whatever in September. We are so, we're like running around not knowing what to deal with. But could you imagine if the entire community's resources and focus and attention across partisan lines, across organizational lines, focused on solving the problem happening mm -hmm. at CUNY, what, what kind of weight that would have? So, can you speak a little bit about what uh, NGU Hatred has been doing? I, I'd like to understand how the Warfare Project works with NGU Hatred. Are they, do they work in tandem? Are they really separate? Do they coordinate? Uh, and what are some of the steps that each are, are taking with respect to CUNY but to let our viewers know? So I, I'm really happy you asked that question. Um, I think one of the most important things that people should take away from this conversation, if anything, is that end Jew hatred, ending Jew hatred is an idea. Okay, it's as much your idea as it is my idea. It's not a 501c3. It's not an organization, another organization competing with, for donor dollars. It's a movement. And you are part of this movement. Anyone watching this live is a part of the end Jew hatred movement and owns it as much as I do. If you believe in ending Jew hatred in this lifetime is the civil rights issue of our lifetime. That's what it is. It's a premise. And we want buy-in from this premise, not just from the Jewish community and from the leaders, but also from our allies. Allyship is so important. I just attended um, the 4th of July weekend uh, seminar, um, well, synagogue really, uh, with Rabbi Mark Schneier in the Hampton Synagogue in West Hampton. And he mentioned that he was called uh, to serve on an advisory board with some other communal leaders uh, for CUNY. And the first thing he did is look around and he said, where are the non-Jews? How is this possible? How is it since the founding of this great country, the United States of America, July 4th, okay, 200 Jews, he said, fought for independence, for American independence. It was the first time in history that Jews fought alongside Christians in the same army for the same goal. And since then, we have marched in every single civil rights movement in this country. We have marched for black civil rights. We have marched for women's rights. We have marched for gay rights. We have marched for Asian rights. But now is the time for Jews to march for Jewish rights. And now is the time also to demand allyship of the communities that we have stood by to stand with us. And there are forces that are trying to separate us. And again, I'll have to reference the interview I did this morning with Joanne Bland, who is the most remarkable person. There are people who are trying very hard to separate the Black community and the Jewish community as two minority communities. But in, in Joanne's words, can you imagine how powerful it would be if our two communities aligned right now and worked together for social justice? So mm -hmm. CUNY. CUNY, we need to remain laser focused. I want to always bring it back to CUNY. Because if you want to do something right now to end Jew hatred, then you have to stand up, you have to make your voice heard. And if you go to, I believe it's the End Jew Hatred website, I think maybe you guys have posted it as well. Yeah. It is a one, a one click way to send a letter and, and to express your disgust with the City University of New York's administration's tolerance of systemic Jew hatred. And I urge you to do that. And then once you've clicked that, the time is for further action. The time is to stand up and attend the protest that we're going to have outside of CUNY. I believe it's on August the 10th. I would check our, our Instagram site. That's the correct. Jewish, the Jewish community, thank you, must mobilize. We must get on the streets and use the same tactics and strategies that other minority communities have used. And to your question, I'll end with this, including impact litigation, but together with on the ground mobiliza mobilization to ensure there are real consequences for Jew hatred. And, um, you know, what we are going to post um, on our, on the SDA Instagram page, uh, a call to action uh, which people will be able to use to uh, link to, to click on and send an email to uh, the Chancellor, CUNY Chancellor Matos Rodriguez, as well as to find out more information about the rally on August 10th. And also to, uh, we, we have to plug you, the pre-order the pre uh, 
the book, uh, the man, a manual for mobilization and Jew hatred, a manual for mobilization. Brooke, can you speak a little bit about uh, your use of social media and the ro role of social media and activism? And while obviously it makes reaching people much easier than knocking on doors, are there challenges that pre that are presented by the use of social media? Is it is it all is it all to the good, or are there any difficulties that you find? Well, we, we face a huge hurdle, and that's the intentionally set algorithms to silence our voices, voices that are calling for Jewish liberation, Jewish unity, for calling for Jews to mobilize and stand up against systemic big, bigotry targeting the Jewish community are being suppressed. It's a very real issue online, um, which is why it's so important to organize in a grassroots level in your community. You know, all it takes is two, three, four, five people to start a chapter, then to recruit 10 more people, recruit 50 more people, and come up with strategies to tackle Jew hatred. I wanna give a, a, a very short story, okay? There were two young men, they were around the ages of 26 and 27 years old, not members of any APAC giving circle or their local federation, they, they're in Germany in Berlin. And they were sick and tired of not being able to walk in a certain area of Berlin that happened to be heavily populated uh, by Muslims without getting beaten up or having to hide their kippah or hide, you know, a Jewish star or any outward sign of your Jewish religion without fear of physical assault. And these two young men worked with the Andrew Hatred Movement. We provide them with pro bono legal and, and uh, a little bit of funding and strategic support. And they managed to mobilize over 450 people in that exact square. The next day, they made the uh, front page of every single major German newspaper, including Der Bild. And a couple weeks later, during the German parliamentary debate, the question asked of those running for office was, one of the questions, how do you intend to end Jew hatred in Germany? And that came from two young men under the age of 30. The power of mobilization and these strategies that have been used and perfected throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s by other minority rights movements must be adopted by us. And the key is that this is not pro-Israel advocacy. This is civil rights advocacy. Now, this may be controversial, but Jewish students on American co college campuses have no responsibility to defend a foreign country. They have no responsibility to engage in national security foreign policy debates, but they do have a responsibility to stand up for themselves if they are being discriminated against. And anti-Jewish discrimination must be met with civil rights advocacy, not with arguments about a foreign country, because then we're giving them an affirmative defense to discriminate against us by coming back with, with these arguments. You know, just that it's, it's wrong. If I hate China because of COVID, it's wrong for me to project my hatred of China on a, on a Chinese American student and discriminate against him or her. But for some reason, it's acceptable to project your hatred of Israel, a foreign country, on a Jew because of the way he or she looks or where they're born or what, you know, the religion they practice. That's political debate. We have to take it out of the political arena and bring it back into the civil rights arena and dialogue. So as you speak at, uh, about um, some of the efforts of ordinary people, young people who are just concerned and, and uh, who acted, um, it, it makes me wonder, what, at what point did you personally in your life, were you a lawyer first and then said, hey, you know, this is something that I need to apply my legal skills? Or did you, did you, were you an activist, a Jewish activist before you were a lawyer? Which came first? And if, if, if you have any uh, insight for uh, Let's see. Um, I initially was studying to become an entertainment lawyer. I went to Cardozo. I did all my internships uh, in entertainment law. I worked for Time Magazine and InStyle Magazine. Um, then I went to work as in-house counsel after I graduated for a small film production company. And I actually ended up producing my own documentary film. It's an award-winning film called The Making of a Martyr. And I did the film about the illegal state-sponsored indoctrination and recruitment of innocent Muslim children towards violence.
violence. I wanted to expose the use of Palestinian Muslim children as suicide bombers, suicide homicide bombers, their use of, as child soldiers and, and human shields. And my documentary, I spent two and a half years in and out with my co-producer, Alistair Leyland, uh, in and out of Janine, Ramallah, Tulkam, and Nabilis. And I risked my life uh, to expose this issue because I felt very strongly about it. Um, I interviewed leaders of terrorist organizations and families of suicide bombers. I went into Israeli prisons. I interviewed children who had attempted to blow themselves up but were arrested. I ended up making this film. And after I made the film, um, I uh, traveled the world because the film did so well. It, it won the Audience Choice Award for Best Film at the 2006 United Nations Documentary Film Festival. It was a star-studded event. We had like Benicio Del Toro give us the award. I ended up spending a year traveling the world talking about what I thought was the greatest human rights issue of our time, which is, again, the, the indoctrination of innocent Muslim children towards violence. And that, to me, is the root cause of the conflict. When children are, you know, stopped, when we stop teaching children to hate, because hatred is taught, Jew hatred is taught. No child is born with hatred in his or her heart. It is taught. And unfortunately, it's a systemic issue in the Islamist world. And I wanted to raise this as a human rights violation, just like, you know, child soldiers in Africa who are kidnapped and drugged and forced to be on the front lines in, in a physical war battle. So too, you know, our a lot of these children who are drugged, uh, a lot of the women are drugged or they're, you know, forced to, to engage in a suicide homicide attack or face an honor killing because they've been accused of being, you know, an adulteress. Um, it's a complicated issue. So I did that film. And then I realized that everybody who was talking about what I was talking about, which was Islamist terrorism after 9-11, started getting slandered. Uh, they started getting accused of being Islamophobic or, or anti-Muslim or racist, which was total, you know, defamation. Um, because if risking my life to make a movie, you know, uh, that argues that Muslim children don't deserve to be killed is anti-Muslim, what then is pro-Muslim? And isn't that the racism, you know, the reverse bigotry? So people who were doing what I was doing started getting sued and, and slandered. And then that's when I, I set up the litigation fund um, and the Lawfare Project over 10 years ago, initially to study this phenomenon of, of lawfare, which is the use of the law as a weapon of war to silence free speech, to undermine democracy. And then we realized that there was a, a total need for a strategic civil rights impact litigation fund to help the Jewish community as the most persecuted minority community in America uh, right now and in the world, frankly, and in human history, that we had not engaged in any type of strategic legal offensive to ensure that our rights were protected in courts of law around the world. We actually helped other minority communities do that. We were lawyers for the Black Civil Rights Movement. Um, we've been lawyers for almost every single civil rights movement, but we haven't advocated for ourselves. You know, there's never been a Jewish civil rights movement in America, ever, which is well, remarkable. An incredible story. The SEA is proud to join with uh, EJH and Jew Hatred uh, in your efforts to try and move the needle and to try and um, mobilize. Um, Brooke, it's, uh, it's about time uh, for the end of our interview. I want to thank you on behalf of the SEA and uh, on behalf of the Sephardic uh, community here. Uh, and we're looking forward to um, standing with you and standing with NGU Hatred on, on August 10th. And uh, we will be in touch and um, uh, thanks for joining us. I want to say again, really how grateful I am for your time, for everybody who's listening today. I have such a tremendous deal of respect for the Sephardic community. And I just want to stress one more time that the NGU Hatred movement is all of us. And when we unify across ethnic, cultural, religious lines, political partisan lines, and focus exclusively on ensuring there are consequences for Jew hatred together, I know that we're going to be able to make a difference. I really believe that. So thank you so much for having me. Okay, thanks, Brooke. And um, again, we're gonna be posting uh, the link in bio for SCA and Jew hatred, the call to action. Go on to the SCA Instagram page. Uh, that's SCA uh, underscore updates uh, and uh, click on the, uh, the icon and um, we'll see you there.
And I'll just put one right. more plug if you don't mind. So my book, End Your Hatred, A Manual for Mobilization is also out. Please consider pre-ordering it and please consider writing a comment in Goodreads. I would be tremendously grateful. Terrific. Thanks, Brooke. Thank you. Happy 4th. Take care. Bye-bye.